Unlike most criminal cases, a protection order, which is like a restraining order, does not carry jail time in the District of Columbia. There are two primary examples of protection orders a court will issue, a civil protection order and an anti-stalking order. These types of orders are very similar and are basically court orders that require one person to stay away from another, although there may be other conditions. In this video, I'll be going over some of the frequently asked questions about temporary protection order, civil protection order, temporary anti-stalking orders, and stalking anti-stalking orders. Uh, my name is Joseph Scrifano, and I'm the founder and managing partner of Scrifano Law PC, where we fight relentlessly on behalf of anyone in trouble who cares about their future. If someone serves you with a temporary protection order and summons for a CPO or ASO hearing, then the, co the court considers you the respondent. Uh, the person who files for the CPO or ASO is considered the petitioner. It's important to understand this terminology so you're aware uh, whether you're the person being accused or the person making the accusation. There are other important terms to know as well. For example, what is a temporary protection order or temporary anti-stalking order? A temporary protection order or TPO is a legal court order requiring one person to stay away from another for 14 days. The purpose of a TPO is to protect the petitioner until a later hearing can be held for before a judge to determine whether to convert the TPO into a CPO or a civil protection order. The main difference between the two is that a TPO remains in effect for 14 days while a CPO can remain in effect for up to two years. A temporary protection order is exactly what it sounds like. It's something that's temporary. In the spring of 2021, the Anti-Stalking Amendment Act in DC went into effect, which allows petitioners to have TPOs extended for up to 28 days at a time. A civil protection order is basically an extension of the temporary protection order for a period of time up to two years. What are the requirements to obtain a TPO or a TASO? The way the process works is that a petitioner will usually file with the court a request for a TPO and CPO. The first requirement is that the petitioner must be in what the law calls an intrafamily relationship with the respondent. However, the law broadly defines an intrafamily relationship to include anyone related by blood, marriage, currently, formerly, or formerly in a romantic relationship, or even roommate. The second thing the petitioner must allege is that the respondent either harassed, assaulted, or, or threatened, or stalked the petitioner. Uh, when the allegation is stalking, the parties don't have to be in an intrafamily relationship. It can be two people who are basically strangers. Once the petitioner files a request for TPO or TASO, an expedited hearing will occur for the judge to determine whether to issue the order. The petitioner must show that they are in some type of danger and need protection the hearing will be heard ex parte, which means the respondent is not present and the judge takes the petitioner's allegations and assumes they are true. If the judge feels it's appropriate to issue a TPO or a TASO, then the petitioner must serve the respondent with the TPO and summons for a CPO hearing. Or for a stalking case, they must serve the respondent with a TASO and summons for the ASO hearing. How do you serve a respondent in a TPO or TASO case? Once the court grants the TPO or TASO, the petitioner must serve the respondent. Service must be done in person and it cannot be done by mail. In addition, the petitioner cannot personally serve the respondent. The court gives a few options, including hiring a process server or requesting that the Metropolitan Police Department actually do the service. Usually, if the petitioner is unable to serve the respondent before the CPO hearing, the court will give additional time for service and extend the TPO for another two weeks or up to 28 days. Now, laws vary throughout the country, but in DC, if the judge denies the TPO, the petitioner may still proceed and request a CPO CPO at a later trial date. The judge may find that the respondent is not in danger, but that does not mean the underlying activity or allegation did not occur. Accordingly, even if someone is in imminent danger, they may is not in imminent danger, they may still prevail at trial at a CPO hearing. Now, what happens at a CPO or ASO hearing? Once the petitioner serves the respondent, the respondent will have a summons to come to court, usually within 14 days when the petitioner filed the TPO or TASO. At the hearing, the parties will check in first thing in the morning, the court will call the case and usually pass it to give the parties a chance to ne 
negotiate with a court-employed attorney mediator. Oftentimes, if the respondent has time to hire an attorney, the attorney may ask the judge for a continuance. The, the lawyer will likely have only received and been retained in the case given the quick turnaround between the TPO and the CPO hearing. Judges will usually grant a request for a hearing for a respondent to hire a lawyer or for a respondent's newly retained attorney to get caught up and prepared to defend against the allegations. If the parties are ready and do not reach a settlement or ask for a continuance, then they'll have a trial. A similar process will occur in an ASO case when the allegation is stalking. For an anti-stalking order, the court may grant an ASO to ensure the petitioner's safety after alleging that the respondent is stalking the petitioner with at least one of the stalking incidents occurring in the past 90 days. Like with the CPO, an ASO is issued after a respondent has had the opportunity and been provided an opportunity to be present at a court hearing and put on a defense. What is the burden of proof at a CPO or ASO hearing? Unlike in criminal cases where the government must prove every element of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt, CPO cases have a much lower burden. The burden of proof for a petitioner in a CPO or ASO case is something called good cause, which the District of Columbia Court of Appeals has interpreted to mean preponderance of the evidence, like in a, like in a civil case. That is the same standard that are in most civil cases like car accidents or personal injury lawsuits. A preponderance of the evidence means that the petitioner must put on slightly more probative evidence than the respondent. Think of a scale where each side puts on evidence on one side. The petitioner's side must slightly weigh more than the respondent's side and tip the scales just ever so slightly in the petitioner's favor to meet the burden of proof. What can happen if the court orders a CPO or ASO in the case? In DC Superior court, judges have the power to order the respondent to stay away from the petitioner, pay restitution, potentially pay attorney's fees, or order other special conditions like make the respondent complete mental health or substance abuse treatment. The court may order any combination of one of two potential stay away orders. One stay away order, typically referred to as a stay away no contact order, requires the respondent to have no communication or no contact or communication with the respondent. Another type of order is commonly referred to as a no hats order, which orders the, re the respondent not to harass, assault, stalk, or threaten the petitioner. Under that order, a respondent may communicate in contact with the petitioner so long as those contacts or communications do not rise to the level of harassment, assaulting, threats, or stalking, which is illegal anyways. It just adds an added level of a court order. What happens if you violate a CPO or ASO? If you violate a CPO or ASO, the petitioner may file a motion with the court alleging contempt of court. This is where things can get very tricky. Where the case originally started out as civil, an allegation and prosecution for contempt of court converts the case into a criminal matter. Each violation of a CPO or ASO can carry a maximum penalty of 180 days in jail and or a $1,000 fine. However, for the allegations to move forward, the Office of Attorney General for the District of Columbia must agree to prosecute the case. That means the petitioner cannot themselves prosecute the re respondent. There will typically be a review period for the prosecutor to decide if they'll go forward. Should I hire a lawyer for a CPO case? Absolutely. As previously stated, these stay away orders can restrict the respondent's freedom of movement, cause them to have to pay money to the petitioner, require them to complete alcohol, drug classes, mental health classes, and any violation of the CPO can be criminally prosecuted. In addition, being subject to any of these orders can make it a crime for you to possess a firearm. So if you or a friend or loved one has been served with one of these protective orders, contact us today for a consultation. Or if you're just interested in learning about legal issues in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to our channel for weekly videos on useful legal topics.